Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Chung, and I'm the director of the Office of Entrepreneurship here at GW. And I want to welcome everyone here to the fourth annual uh, GW Business Plan Competition. Uh, what are we doing here today? What is this business plan competition? Well, GW started this up four years ago um, with the generous donation of Rick and Ann Scott, our, our founding sponsors. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know Rick and Ann, um, Rick is the uh, governor of Florida, and um, their daughter, Allison Grimard, who's one of our judges today, is, um, uh, was a, uh, a student here at GW. And they came together uh, with John Rollins and uh, helped found the um, business plan competition four years ago. But you know, why, why do they care about this? Why do we care about entrepreneurship at, um, at GW? Well, for those of you who have been paying any attention to the news, um, the local news in, in GW, you'll, you've probably heard that there is a renaissance of entrepreneurship going on here in the DC area. Um, innovation, um, we've got some incredible startups um, sprouting up here, uh, like Living Social, um, uh, O Power, um, GW, uh, DC is just really becoming uh, a, a hotbed of innovation. And uh, GW is, is at the center of it. Here in the middle of the city, uh, we have the largest um, population of, of students. Um, we got an engineering school, business school, law school, um, everything that you need to have the components to really build up um, innovation. So I can say that uh, we care about entrepreneurship because GW is, is helping to lead it here at, at, in DC. Um, we have put together a lot of programming around entrepreneurship. Um, the uh, business plan competition is one of the centerpieces of, of our programs. So I think that you'll notice, for those of you who've been following the business plan competition, the quality of the presentations, the quality of the startups, the number of startups that we've been getting hasn't been improving every year. I think a lot of that is due to all the effort in the, uh, the, into the program that we put in. For example, we have pretty much a, on a weekly basis workshops um, built around the business plan competition on everything from how do you write a business plan to how do you raise financing, how do you do market research, et cetera. I would say that if, of the eight finalists here, I think every finalist has participated in those workshops and, is, and that has fed into the quality of, what, of the work they're doing. We have programs like the GWIRT Mentors Program that was started up um, uh, last year um, where we provide very experienced mentors, serial entrepreneurs, lawyers, uh, accountants, other, other startup professionals to um, provide uh, guidance to our young entrepreneurs and first-time entrepreneurs. And that's been a very successful program. We have a new student incubator as well uh, that students are able to go into and, and uh, hobnob with other startups in the area and get um, advice and, and, and guidance there. Um, Funzy, Wiseag, College and Cooks, a uh, num number of the other startups have all been participating in these incubators and mentorship programs. We also did, for the first time this year, a Startup Career Expo where we invited all of the university students to come in. We had, over, we had 85 startups come and uh, 350 students, including not just from GW, but Georgetown, um, George Mason, University of Maryland. And we're doing that because we want to be a good community member and we're bringing together the region together um, to help foster entrepreneurship. So. Um, that's why you know, I can say um, proudly that GW is really trying to lead the um, effort in, in bringing entrepreneurship and um, helping innovation here in D.C. So today we have some amazing startups that you'll be um, listening to giving presentations. But none of this, all of this would, none of this would be, have been possible without the um, generous sponsors that um, have come together uh, to bring this all to you um, and f support us financially and with prizes. Um, internally, um, you should know that this is not just a, a, a competition for the business school, um, which is some, what some people seem to think. It's really a cross-school collaboration. We have an amazing group of deans at GW who have, taken, uh, uh, have come to the realization that entrepreneurship is not just for business students. Entrepreneurship is something that every single profession, every single discipline really needs to have in their, in their toolkit uh, in, as they go about their career. So we have the business school, the engineering school, the Co Columbian College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Medicine, the Elliott School, and the Graduate School of Education and Human Development, all providing um, generous financial contributions to this competition. 
And in fact, um, if you look at the entries for the business comp competition, every single school in the university has been represented. I think this is the first time that that's happened. So this is really becoming much more uh, of a, a cross-school collaboration. Um, our external sponsors, um, this year we have Capital One as our, um, uh, as our um, platinum sponsor. Um, and they have a, a, they've given us $10,000 for the Capital One undergraduate prize. And Jamila Breithwaite is one of our judges and sitting here in the front. Um, gold sponsor, um, second year in a row, Blank Rome. Um, Peter Weissman is here for representing them, but they are providing $5,000 in cash plus $4,000 in legal advising service for free to um, the top four winners, uh, so $1,000 each. Um, and then we have some very generous uh, gifts from uh, in-kind sponsors, the Plug and Play Tech Center, which is a Silicon Valley incubator. Um, they have um, provided a, a prize that is called the Plug and Play Award, and it provides for a three-month accelerator um, program out in Silicon Valley at their incubator out there, um, plus um, travel expenses. Now, I was talking to uh, one of our judges, Shoa Kai Lu, who's a, a VC out in California, and he was telling me, oh, I, you know, those guys, I, one, of my, one of my startups, one of my investments is in the Plug and Play Tech Center. They're really good. This is a good prize for, for your people. So very excited to hear that. I mean, I, I, I went out there and visited them myself, and it's a pretty amazing facility they have there. Um, then iStrategy Labs, uh, which is an uh, online marketing strategy development firm, is providing a half-day marketing workshop. Um, this is a very highly valued prize. If, uh, for those of you not familiar or not from the D.C. area, iStrategy Labs is the uh, online marketing company um, in D.C. Um, Peter Corbett and DJ Saul have done an amazing job of bringing together the um, tech community here in D.C. Um, and iStrategy Labs is, is really uh, central to that. Um, and then Brazen Careerist, um, Ed Barrientos in the audience, a GW alum, um, as well as the winner of last year's GWIRT um, Entrepreneurial uh, 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 Award um, and CEO of um, Brazen Careerist has given 20 free how to get your business online workshops for the uh, finalists in the, uh, in the competition. So um, Brazen Careerist for, is a online recruiting tool for students and employers to connect with each other. Uh, we've used it here at GW. It's a fantastic um, platform. Um, love it. It's a very innovative um, way to be able to do your recruiting. And again, finally, our, our founding sponsors, um, Ann and Rick Scott, thank you very much, um, Ann, for, for your generous uh, and support for, uh, over all these years. And, uh, and uh, with that, uh, I'd like to move on to our, uh, our keynote speaker. So whenever we have a keynote speaker, I, I like to go out and talk to people about who we should bring in um, and talk to other entrepreneurs in the area. And uh, this, this year it was really easy because pretty much everyone I talked to said, oh, you got to get Human Radfer. Like, why? He said, well, he's really hot. His company's really hot. And he's a really good speaker. So you got to get Human. So fortunately, we were able to get Human um, between, uh, between his busy schedule. But he is the um, executive chairman and co-founder of ClearSpring Technologies. So Human actively drives the platform marketing and strategy initiatives at ClearSpring. He was the company's CEO from its founding in 2006 through 2011. He has earned a number of industry accolades, including being one of tech's best entrepreneurs by Business Week magazine and one of iMedia's 25 most influential marketers. He has twice been nominated for Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Award. He graduated magna cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania um, in economics and computer science and an MS from Carnegie Mellon, and where he researched social networking theory. Um, he's a popular speaker at major industry events at um, AdTech, OMA, South by Southwest, Digital Hollywood, Digital Media Conference, and the list goes on. Uh, so we're very lucky to have Human here today, and um, he'll tell you more about his uh, great company, what he's been doing. All right, thanks. I think I have a mic. Yeah. We're good. Okay, is everyone awake? Really, are you awake? I'm not awake, okay. All right, so you guys are gonna wake me up. So I, I thank you very much for having me. Uh, I've, uh, I'm really excited about this, so I benefited a lot from programs like this um, at Carnegie Mellon, at Penn, and so this is a great thing, and, and so you guys should be very grateful that these guys put in a lot of work, and, and the sponsors and everyone else, so thanks for having me. Hopefully I can kick it off and, and get you guys at least a little bit awake. Um, so uh, as Jim mentioned, I'm an internet nerd, so I'm gonna focus a little bit on the internet um, how many of you guys are starting businesses that are online businesses? 
Okay. Um, how many of you guys are starting businesses that at least have a component of it that's online? Okay. All right, great. So what I wanted to talk to you guys about uh, is something that I think is going to impact all of you guys regardless and the world as a whole, which is basically in five years, we're going to now have almost five billion people online. And I think that when you look at the Internet right now, people oftentimes think of it a little bit you know, in a trailing way. And I want to give you a couple stats that I think um, will let you know that this stuff's happening a lot faster than we think. Okay. So how many of you guys remember this, uh, this little guy here? Maybe I'm, a little, I'm getting old for an Internet guy. Um, so the dot-com boom, that was where it all started, I think, when people think of web, IPOs, um, valuations. This, this little uh, hand puppet here symbolizes all that went wrong with that uh, 1999 to 2001 period, um, pets.com. Web 1.0 was really about the promise of the Internet. And what that meant, when you look at the promise, was the Internet was going to change everything. Brick and mortar was going to get destroyed. Everything was going to move online. You saw every single person flooding to own every domain from you know, pets.com, shoes.com, you pick it. Um, the theory that was behind that is actually correct. Unfortunately, the infrastructure was too expensive, so the cost of service it, and there weren't really a lot of people online. So when you look at AOL, who was really the centerpiece of the Internet ecosystem at that time, they, re they peaked out at about 30 million subscribers, right? So there just weren't enough users. It cost too much to deliver the service. And as you saw, you know, the, the public markets shook out, and we had you know, a little bit of a dark period in the Internet. So lo and behold, Web 2.0, which is now officially uh, dead because that conference is, is, is gone. I was actually one of the first speakers at that, so I'm a little bit sad uh, to see that go. But... Web 2.0, um, there was a series of companies primarily characterized by the fact that they were driven by social. Uh, LinkedIn, as you know, recently went public, would be one of those companies. You had Facebook, um, a number of the social marketing platform companies like ourselves that, that all came out. Web 2.0 is delivering on that vision. And, and if there's one thing that I, I want you guys to take away from this keynote is that this is one of the most exciting times to start a business. It really is. Um, it's cheaper. Um, everything is a lot easier. There's a lot more advisors. There's a lot more mentors. And I'll go through that a little bit more. Um, but you have real companies that are coming out right now, really large companies with a lot of revenue. They're growing quickly. Um, so all, our investors uh, have invested on my board in companies like Groupon, Living Social, um, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, those types of companies. They're really, really, really rapidly growing. Web 1.0 are characterized by a lot of growth, not a lot of revenue. These companies have serious revenue. Facebook... Um, was estimated to do about $4.32 billion in revenue. So um, these are real companies. Now, is there a lot of, are there a lot of challenges in the industry? Yes, um, but the opportunity is massive, and the opportunity to grow quickly is massive. So there's three major trends here that, that are driving this whole thing, just to keep it at a high level. Mobile, development of the cloud, and social. And so I want to talk about those three things. So right now, there are about 1.8 billion people online. So mobile right now, there are about roughly 5 billion, 5 to 6 billion people who have mobile access, right? But they're feature phones. The vast majority of people don't have smartphones. About 30% of those people uh, have smartphones today. So that's where you get that number, 1.8 billion. What's happening, though, is everyone's getting smartphones really quickly. So for instance, how many people here have smartphones? Right? And it's going really, really fast. I mean, you, you do, I do kind of one of those eye checks. I, I travel on planes a lot, and you see the iPad just like popping up everywhere. It's a phenomenon. But as much as mobile is about you know, us being able to take computing with us everywhere, the big outcome of this is just numbers. So if everyone gets a feature phone, everyone gets an iPad, the entire world is going to be online. Right? And that, that's happening very quickly. When you look at the numbers that I gave, about 30% of these people have uh, smartphones. Smartphone adoption is growing quickly. So that means within you know, five-ish years, you're going to have more people going online than there are total online today. Right? And a lot of that's international. The second fact that you want to take away is the cloud computing fact. And so there's a lot of you know, hubbub about the cloud and all that. But the, main, the economic facts to take away from here are, are simple as an entrepreneur. So when I started my business, we had to go put up servers, right? So we were physically you know, going out, racking them up. We had to install databases. We had to understand servers. You don't have to do that anymore. 
you go onto Amazon, you can throw up a service, and it's pretty cheap to start, right? So you have a, a low cost to actually enter a market. The cool part about it is all of your costs as you scale are variable, right? So it's not like you have, the, you have to go out and you know, raise $2 million when you have a huge amount of growth. You can actually you know, see, grow as you scale with Amazon Web Services and other things. So cloud computing really, from, at the end of the day, for an entrepreneur, presents an opportunity to actually test things, to not have to raise a whole bunch of money at the beginning, and to start very easily. And the last piece is social, which I mean I could talk about for forever. Um, but the big thing to take away uh, as a general principle is that it's making us all addressable. So before Facebook came out, the web was built around you know the Google principle. Google built the web around an anonymity, right? So. People didn't know who you were online. You're searching, you're visiting websites. Your identity wasn't part of the internet. That's fundamentally shifting. And Facebook is driving that change. So everyone on Facebook obviously knows you're, you're addressing yourself by first name, last name. Facebook isn't really a website. It's a platform. And they've made this huge shift. They announced Facebook platform in 2007. And they've been going out on the internet. Um, and doing something that's called Facebook Connect Facebook Platform. So how many of you guys have seen, you know, log into Facebook when you go to a website, log in with Twitter um, when you're logging in applications? How many people have done it? So I remember when it came out, people were saying, no one's ever going to do that. No one's going to give up their identity online. Now if you don't see that button, you're like, I'm not filling out that form. You know? uh, I, can't, I can't log into yet another app. But the beauty of what that's doing to the internet is beyond Facebook. It's much bigger than Facebook. So now, if you go to NBC.com, if you go to any of these sites, they actually not, they know who you are, right? And so they can personalize the service. They get your profile information. This is a massive change in the way that things are done. I mean, it seems very simple, but that's why it's so powerful. Um, so when you put together these three trends, right, and you just scope it out over five years, you're going to have five billion people online, right, in the next couple of years. You're going to be able to serve them at variable cost, very cheaply through the cloud, right? Anyone can throw up an application, and they're all going to be addressable. You can actually communicate with them on a first name, last name basis, and know who they are. That is a massive change in the way you're doing business because of one simple thing. You can now, all of you guys, build a business that addresses one billion people, right? So think about that for a second. One billion people. How many, how many companies can say that they address a billion people? Facebook, which is one of the fastest growing companies in the world, today is about to approach a billion. But that is going to become a standard, I think, for a lot of services online to hit. Whereas right now, we're thinking in millions. So that's, that's the big takeaway. And I think all of you guys, it's exciting that you guys can, can actually steer that. So now that you have this world you know, of cloud computing, mobile, you, know, you can distribute your apps all over the place, the real opportunity as a business person is that you can actually disrupt marketplaces. Right? And so I want to talk to you about a couple ways that you can do this and ways to think about um, these trends, because technology is important, but you have to start with the business problem. You have to start with the pain point, right? So um, I'll give you a couple examples. So how many people have heard of Square? So Square was founded by a guy named Jack Dorsey. Um, in fact, Jack was in the same Business Week article I was. He did a little bit better than I did. But uh, he founded Twitter, which was Twitter, no E at the time. Um, and it was funny, I remember talking to him uh, after that, and he was talking, he's like, you know, I think payments really can get disrupted. I'm like, dude, you're starting Twitter, you know, it's crazy. And then he went and started Square. So he's the chairman of Twitter, uh, and he's also the CEO of Square. And I think the total value of those two companies is over $11 billion. And he's one guy, so smart dude. Um, <laughs> so the main trend here, for those of you guys that are not familiar with Square, is, is a simple idea. Um, and Jack is a big fan of simple ideas, and I... I think all of you guys should think as simply as you can because that makes it very, very big. Um, everyone has a mobile device. Let's make everyone uh, have the power to be a merchant. So this little square can plug into the headphone jack in your iPhone, in your Android device. And any of you guys basically can issue payments. So I can go out, start a lemonade stand outside, put my square in my phone, and one of you guys can come in, buy lemonade with your credit card. Everyone can become a merchant. I mean massively disruptive, right? So. Anyone can go out, start a business. You don't have to worry about cutting a deal, you know, working with Amex, working with MasterCard. This is an empowering technology that's massively disruptive. So rectangles to square is, is one thing to think about. How can you guys think of simple ideas that are going to disrupt the payment space? 
The next one is box to bits, and this is one of the more famous ones that everyone attributes to online, right? And, and I'm personally, I, I, never, I never celebrate the downfall of any company, but Blockbuster charged me so much in late fees uh, that, that I, I'm, I, I was joking around with the chief digital officer at Blockbuster. I was like, dude, I had a party when you guys, uh, when you guys uh, got whipped by Netflix. Um, he's a good guy. They actually, ironically, uh, are with Dish Network now and are doing quite well. Um, but this idea is simple. Uh, digital media, in terms of a physical medium, is gone. That's not happening anymore. You can't think about it. Um, floppy disks obviously go away. CDs are going away. DVDs are going away. So you can't think like that anymore. So how is that going to change and impact your business? How can you take something into the digital form and, and move it away from uh, the offline channels? And that same thing applies, actually, to the offline to online for things like Groupon and everything else, right? How do you address a consumer using a mobile channel when they're in the physical world? The next one is, is, is a little bit more uh, intricate here. So how many people are familiar with Bloomberg? OK, so Bloomberg has the terminals. Uh, the investment bankers all sit there and glued to the screen, getting information, hope to God to make an extra three cents you know, on a transaction, which turns into billions, which you know, some guy gets really rich and you know, good for him. But the big shift here is not just um, getting package information from analysts and getting research where they do polls and panels and things like that, but actually measuring online behavior. So this is, this is the centerpiece of big data. So companies like ours, so we measure 1.2 billion unique users per month, um, roughly 70% of the entire internet right now in real time. You take that information, you actually see what people are doing and pack, process it with big data, what can you change, right? Instead of doing panels and polls and so on and so forth. So you're moving away from this idea of paneled information over to, I'm just going to literally measure everything because now processing cloud computing has made it so cheap and use real data. That's incredibly powerful. If you look at the financial example, you move, if you can make trades happen 1% more efficiently, you can make billions and billions of dollars. A um, couple more examples here. I saw I'm flagging the card here. Um, hotels to homes. Uh, this is a fun example. So uh, one of the companies that uh, one of our investors invested in is called Airbnb. Do you guys know Airbnb or have used Airbnb? Airbnb? No, not as much? OK. It's, it's actually a pretty cool company. So the idea is you, know, you have an apartment, you have a home, but you're not there sometimes, right? It'd be great to make you know, a little bit of extra money. So what they've done is transform shared space, right? So this idea that I'm not home all the time, um, but I might actually want to make some money into a virtual hotel room. So I might want to go to South by Southwest, can't find a hotel. Um, so I go to Airbnb, I log in, and guess what happens? I can find like, a really sweet apartment, someone's not in there, and I pay half the price. So I win as a consumer because I get a really nice place. The other guy wins because he gets a little bit of money. In fact, there was a story on TechCrunch about a startup that got funded by just, they were, le they were renting out their place on Airbnb while they were traveling to, to go and try to raise money. <laughs> And so they raised like $50,000, $100,000, right? So think about this idea of how you can create a marketplace out of shared things. There are other examples like Zipcar or Rideshare. Like all of these things are happening where you can create marketplaces with online. Um, Boston to the beach. And I don't know, but maybe this is a little bit of an older example. Boston has uh, Route 128. But now that you have online, it's very, very easy to telecommute. And this was a big wave you know, in the early... Uh, early dot-com boom, everyone's like, oh, everyone's going to work from home. Well, not really on a 56K connection on your crappy little uh, computer and things like that. But now you have these really rich connections. Um, you have developers everywhere. And you almost have to be flexible. So at our company, for example, at Netflix, at a bunch of companies, we don't have set vacation policies. We don't have set hours in the office. People basically can come and go as they please. So if someone says, hey, you know, I don't work on Fridays, they don't work on Fridays. If they say, hey, I'm going to work two weeks out of the year from France, OK, as long as they're getting their work done. And we're, we're actually a more conservative version of this example. Some companies like WordPress, who's one of the largest publishing platforms, they're almost entirely virtual. They're like a 100-person team. None of them are in the same office space, yet they've built one of the largest publishing platforms in the world. So when you're building your businesses, think to yourself, how can I attract, recruit people in this virtual model? Because it's becoming increasingly, A, uh, the way that people want to work, and B, it's a way to compete with some of these large you know, competitive people. So the last point I want to make here, uh, and then I'll wrap up, is 
basically when you look at these trends of what's happening, human beings think linearly, right? So we always predict that technology is going to work a certain way. So you look in the 60s, for example, um, and sci-fi is a great predictor of, of what culture is and where it's going to be. So do you guys know uh, Space Odyssey? Have you ever seen that movie? It was 2001. Okay, so there was this movie basically that it was cast in space in the future, and there's this like evil AI thing that takes over, and, and these people are, are getting killed by it. Um, watch it sometime. It's very, very long. But the, the story of it, the, the real principle there is when you look at how they projected technology, it was linear. At the time, there was this huge space race. And so it was all about space, all about space, and everything was around that. No one cared about space after that, right? Because they didn't predict you know, the seismic shift that was going to occur in economies such that space race wasn't a big deal. No one cared about it anymore. And so that's because we think linearly. You have to think exponentially, right? So what's happening right now is computing is growing. Uh, you guys are familiar with Moore's Law, right? So processing power is, is doubling every 18 months. Storage is going down exponentially in terms of costs. So it would cost, I guess, a uh, million dollars for a gigabyte of storage in 1980. A gigabyte. Now it costs 10 cents, right? That's going, again, on an exponential curve. As businesses move online, everything is becoming subject to this exponential curve. Healthcare, finance, everything is moving faster and faster and faster. In fact, when you look at this curve, and I know it's a little bit messy of a chart, look at the end. What's ending up happening, if you project out to 2020, right, is there, that a computer is going to have enough processing power, processing power to actually represent the intelligence of a human being. That's not that far away. It's, it's 2012 now, right? That's in eight years. Now, does that mean that the computer is going to be us and talking to us? Totally different you know, question. But the processing power is going to be there, right? And so how can that, I mean, we, that's going to totally change the way that we're thinking, right? So again, when you look at everything out here, things are going to move incredibly fast. You're going to have a ton of people online. You're going to have a ton of intelligence. So you guys have a massive opportunity in front of you. Uh, it's incredibly exciting. You know, you guys are at the early stages of your business, and I hope you know, you guys find the internet, you find the opportunities as exciting as I do. So, thank you very much for having me.